Confirm shoot. 1600 to command post, 2nd Marine Division. Situation ashore. Casualties, many. Percentage dead, unknown. Combat efficiency, we are winning. Colonel David M. Shoup's situation report accurately summed up the situation on November 21st, 1943 on Basio Island, the largest of the islands that make up the Central Pacific Atoll of Tarawa. The battle being fought there was America's first strategic offensive against the Empire of Japan that had so viciously attacked the United States on December 7th, 1941. Despite serious losses almost immediately after Pearl Harbor, the United States had managed to halt the growth of the massive Japanese empire by early 1943. Having halted the Japanese, they turned to the offensive. The Gilbert Islands were the logical first step. They were the closest Japanese bases to allied New Zealand and were the best route to Japanese bases in the Marshall Islands, which would have to be taken before any assault on the islands surrounding Japan could be carried out. Admiral Chester Nimitz decided that the first step would be to take Tarawa Atoll and the Gilbert Islands because it had a 4,000 foot airfield. That airfield was located on Bishio Island. Bishio has an area of only 291 acres, less than half of a square mile, yet the Japanese had turned this island into a forbidding fortress, ready to deal out death to any attackers. Before an attacking force could even get to the island, they would have to cross a coral reef about 600 yards wide which surrounded the island. The water over this reef was, at times, too shallow for conventional landing craft. In addition, hundreds of bunkers housing machine guns and artillery covered every square inch of the island and its beaches. To make matters worse, 4,836 of the best Japanese troops manned these positions. The commander of the Japanese, Rear Admiral Kiji Shibashaki said, a million men cannot take Tarawa in a hundred years. On November 19, 1943, a U.S. convoy of around 100 ships was resting near Basio Island. On board were 12,000 Marines of the 2nd Marine Division, veterans of the brutal fighting at Guadalcanal. Early the next morning, all the battleships of the convoy opened up on Basio Island. Thousands of huge 16 and 18 inch shells were hurled at the island. A Japanese lieutenant described the bombardment this way. The earth shook. The sky was a fiery ball. We were flung around like rag dolls by the explosions. All told, the Navy would pour 3,000 tons of shells into Basio before the troops even landed. Meanwhile, the Marines of the 2nd Marine Division were loaded into their landing craft and, at 8.30 a.m., the order to attack was given. When the first waves of troops, all in track landing craft called Amtraks, reached the reef, their boats grounded. Fortunately, the tracks enabled the Amtraks to climb over the reef and continue towards shore. Immediately, the Amtraks were surrounded in a hail of machine gun and artillery fire. When the conventional landing craft of the next waves got to the reef, they grounded and could go no further. Returning Amtraks took some of those men to the beach, but most would have to wade in. For those men who made it to the beach, the situation was no better, if not worse. The Japanese machine guns were placed to fire right over the top of a four-foot seawall. This meant that the only safe place on the beach was right next to that seawall. However, hiding behind the seawall wasn't going to help take the island. What the Marines had to do was climb over the seawall under the coverless interior and somehow knock out hundreds of concrete blockhouses. For most of them, this was a new experience altogether. They soon discovered that the only way to knock out these blockhouses was to crawl up to their entrance or firing slid and toss a grenade or dynamite block through it, then shoot down the Japanese that ran out. The Marines could use other equipment, such as flamethrowers, tanks, or artillery, to get the Japanese out faster. In the hours after the landing, the Marines managed to get two small footholds on the island. The next day, the Marines were still clinging tenaciously to the small footholds they had on Basio. However, they desperately needed reinforcements. Unfortunately, the reinforcements had to wait in under murderous machine gun fire because there weren't enough Amtraks for them. Lieutenant Commander McPherson described the Marines waiting in like this. The water was dotted with men advancing a step at a time as though in slow motion. They kept falling, falling, falling. Singly, in groups, and in rows. Of one group of 800 men, only 450 made it to the beach unwounded. Although these men suffered terrible casualties in landing, 
they helped secure the American position and turn the tide of battle in the Americans' favor. Around dusk, the unpredictable tide had risen enough that the Americans were finally able to land their badly needed supplies. The next day, the Marines began pushing inland to expand their holdings, and, with the newly landed tanks and artillery, were able to painstakingly knock out almost all the Japanese positions on the western half of the island. That night, at 4 a.m., hundreds of Japanese troops charged the American lines. Thanks to heavy supporting fire from the destroyers in the lagoon, the Marines repulsed the Japanese. Extremely heavy Japanese casualties in the counterattack broke the back of organized resistance on Beisho. When the Marines attacked the next morning, they easily mopped up the remaining Japanese, and at 1.05 p.m., the island was declared secure. With Beisho secured, the Marines turned their attention to the other islands of Tarawa Atoll and secured them a few days later. The battle for Beisho was only 76 hours long. In that 76 hours, the United States lost 1,027 men killed and 2,292 men wounded. For comparison, the United States lost almost the same number of men in the six months of fighting for Guadalcanal. In the history of the Marine Corps, no other battle has produced a greater ratio of men killed or wounded to men involved. On the Japanese side, of 4,800 men on the island, only 17 soldiers and 129 Korean forced laborers survived as prisoners. However, numbers alone will never really tell the full tragedy. Every one of those who died left behind parents and a wife or girlfriend who would never fully recover from the loss. Many of the wounded would have to face the difficulties of living without an arm or a leg, and everyone, wounded or not, would have to live with the terrifying memories of their experience there. The large casualties sustained at Tarawa had put the entire Central Pacific campaign in jeopardy. Admiral Nimitz quickly had replicas of the Tarawa defenses constructed on one of the Hawaiian Islands and ordered tests to discover the best way to attack them. The Marines discovered that tanks, flamethrowers, and bazookas were absolutely necessary for these types of operations. The Navy learned that careful, aimed, plunging fire was needed to crack open enemy bunkers. Due to the nature of fringing reefs surrounding many atolls, more Amtraks with heavier armor were deemed absolutely necessary to future operations. These improvements would be vital to the success of the upcoming amphibious campaigns in the war. The first of these was the campaign against the Japanese bases in the Marshall Islands in February 1944. In only 22 days, the Marines captured these bases with a loss of only 594 soldiers killed, just over half of the losses sustained at Tarawa. The lessons learned at Tarawa would be applied again and again throughout the Pacific campaigns, enabling the United States to take many other islands with much less loss of life. These lessons are the real triumph of Tarawa. Tarawa was a battle of intense brutality and amazing sacrifice. There, a thousand young men were cut down in their prime, and thousands more left with deep scars in both the mind and the flesh. At the same time, many vital lessons were learned. Lessons that would prevent the deaths of many thousands more and dramatically shorten the war. So is Tarawa a triumph or a tragedy? Do the benefits of lives saved being campaign shortened outweigh the suffering of the hundreds who died and the thousands who left with severe wounds? It's a tough question, but the answer is yes. That doesn't mean that the blood spilled on Tarawa was a good thing. On the contrary, every life lost was a terrible tragedy. However, the United States took this tragedy and searched it thoroughly for lessons to use next time. The Marines who died on Tarawa did not die in vain. They sacrificed their lives for the thousands of Americans who would land on other beaches and for the millions back home. For this sacrifice, they deserve the honor of every true American. They must, they will be remembered.